Good afternoon. My name is Nicoletta Pirezzo. I'm the inaugural director of the Georgetown Humanities Initiative. And uh, together with my colleagues and co-organizers, Lourdes Ortega, Anna Defina, and uh, Negar Siari, I wish to welcome all of you to the first event uh, of the spring semester in our ongoing Global Humanities Seminar Series, Understanding and Including Forced Migrants and Refugees, Responses from the Humanities. The series showcases interdisciplinary work in the humanities about forced migration and refugees involving narrative, arts, identity, and language. We invite you to check our website at migrationhumanities.georgetown.domains if you wish to take a look at our complete program. The site also includes a discussion board where you can post your comments and keep the conversation open about the issues we explore. We are grateful to the Office of the Vice President for Global Engagement for the grant that has made this project possible, and to the college Zoom team, Lindellas and Candace Mosley for their technical support. I wish to add that this event is being recorded. Our three events in the fall semester addressed the plight of displacement by focusing on representations of migrants and refugees in literature, linguistics, and the visual arts. The two language and migration scholars who are with us today have worked not only on, but above all with migrants and refugees who from various countries resettled in Italy and New Zealand. Both speakers will discuss their collaborative projects like documentaries and digital installations through which they give voice to individual and collective experiences of forced mobility and the difficult process of integration, but trying not to speak on behalf of their interlocutors. This conversation will also be an opportunity to reflect on the challenges and rewards of this kind of partnerships between researchers and diasporic communities. Before giving the floor to our speakers, I am now happy to hand it over to my colleagues, Professors Lourdes Ortega from the Initiative for Multilingual Studies and Anna Defina from the Department of Italian Studies, who will introduce our two guests. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicoletta, and it is a true honor to introduce Corinne Seals. Um, she's a senior lecturer of applied linguistics at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. She received her PhD in linguistics from our own Georgetown University in 2013, and while working at the Ukrainian language representative in the Center for Applied Linguistics in Washington, DC. She is Ukrainian American by birth, and her work focuses primarily on supporting language maintenance, language rights, and identity for both migrant speakers in the diaspora and indigenous speakers. All of Corinne's research includes a focus on community empowerment, which is realized through community researcher partnerships, community responsive methodologies, and community focused outputs. She's the primary investigator of a three-year New Zealand Royal Society grant supporting language education for Maori and Samoan children in New, in New Zealand. She's also the primary investigator of a two-year cross-disciplinary grant working with Ukrainian refugees and their families. And recently, she's also the co-PI of a new British Academy grant funded project bringing together the voices of, of those in three diaspora communities and artists from each community to create the belonging in the diaspora online gallery that she will be showing us later. Anna? Hello. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Gerardo Mazzaferro, uh, Gerardo is the Senior Lecturer of Linguistics at the University of Torino in Italy. His research interests lie in issues related to migration and language. Uh, he draws on ideas developed in sociolinguistics of, in the sociolinguistics of globalization, discourse studies, multilingualism, and translanguaging. 
He also draws on areas like the sociolinguistics of immigration and mobility and immobility studies, particularly on processes of reconstruction of asylum, asylum seekers and refugees, linguistic practices, subjectivities and identities in contexts of forced immobilization. He uses linguistic ethnography and qualitative research methods and tools. He is also the organizer of the International Conference on the Sociolinguistics of Immigration, which has been taking place for regularly for a number of years. And he is now part of a EU-funded project, the new ABC, Networking the Educational World Across Boundaries for Community Building. And his team is working on a pilot action project on international migrations and immobilities, offline online practices, identities, agency, and voice of young migrants. He's an activist and volunteer in local grassroots organizations involved in the reception and support of asylum seekers and refugees. Thank you, Nicoletta. Thank you very much, uh, Lourdes and Anne. Now, Corinne Seals and uh, Gerardo Mazzaferro will talk about their work for about 10 minutes each. Organizers and the selected students will then ask them some questions, followed by a Q&A with the audience at large. So you're all welcome from the audience to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A function because we have uh, disabled the chat. Now we look forward to hearing from Corinne and then Gerardo. Thank you very much. Kia ora kota. Good morning, everyone. And thank you to the organizers um, for the invitation to be here. Hopefully my sound is okay. I'm currently on research leave somewhere else. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so thank you again for the invitation. As Lourdes mentioned, I have two branches to my work, one working with indigenous communities uh, and supporting language reclamation efforts and another working with diaspora communities and um, supporting language maintenance efforts and also uh, resettlement efforts. So um, one of the projects that Lourdes mentioned and that I thought I'd share today is the Belonging in the Diaspora project. So with all of the work I do, there's a, a major focus on uh, community partnership and all of the uh, work that we do, the focus of it, the uh, output at the end um, are informed by what would be most helpful for the communities that we're working with. And I directly ask communities throughout the course of working with them, what would be helpful for them, what they'd like to see, um, and we brainstorm ideas together. And one of those ideas was the Belonging in the Diaspora online gallery. Now it was originally meant to be an art installation that would travel, um, but then COVID happened. <laughs> and it actually turned out quite nice as an online art gallery. And we've got it open for two years. I think we're about a year in. So we've got uh, the online gallery going for a bit longer, uh, I think slightly less than a year. Um, so I will go ahead and share with you and kind of talk through some of what we did with that. Again, everything that we're doing is community-based in partnership. And um, I also wanted to mention that this project is also what, the inspiration for a new project that's upcoming that I'm getting ready to start with some collaborators where we'll be using um, participant-driven methods, ethnographic methods, and we'll be creating uh, videos and art similar to what we're doing here, all made by people from within the community. So that will be coming up in the next few years. And this is the first project of a set of what I hope is many. So let's see, so this, can everyone see that okay? Okay, so this is the Belonging in the Diaspora online gallery. You can access it if you go to belongingandthediaspora.com. And this project was inspired by a focus on asking the communities, which myself and two collaborators are a part of, asking the communities, what does it mean to you to belong? 
and how has this changed over time and what is home? And so uh, what we did, I'll go here to the project. You can scroll down. There's lots of beautiful things on this. I'll come back to, but first I'll jump into here where it says the project. And you can read some about the details of what we did um, on your own time, of course, I'll just summarize. <laughs> But uh, it was myself and two other researchers leading this project. And then we had support from uh, my lovely friend, Francesca Bonocci for um, designing the online gallery. And uh, like I said, we the three of us drew from our own communities. So my work was with Ukrainians in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And one of my Co-researchers worked with Trinidadians in the UK, which is her community. And another researcher worked with Chinese in Australia, which is her community. And so we interviewed people in our communities, um, people who we know, uh, also friends of friends at times, but people who were very keen to be a part of the project. And we asked people very open-ended questions about about what is home, you know, when you think of home, what is that? And has that changed for you over time um, since you've been here? And um, in my case, I was also asking people about the invasion um, by Russia and asking, you know, how, has that had any effect as well? So this data was collected at the end, uh, the interviews at the end of 2021, which was when there was, again, a lot of speculation about would Russia push its invasion further past Eastern Ukraine? And as we all know, by February um, 24th, they did in 2022, but this, the interviews were done a few months before. So at that time, there was still a lot of speculation, but still it was highly relevant for people to think about and talk about what that meant for their sense of where they belong and where they felt they needed to connect to. Um, and then we took the interviews and went through and found quotes that spoke to us and spoke to the participants themselves and spoke to the artists. So we worked with artists from each community as well. So my artist, she's Ukrainian from, New she was living in New Zealand at the time. Um, and then it's the same case for each of the other artists. And we gave them the quotes to work with. So here's the details on each of this and then this is researchers but we're the least important so we come last um but so here if you click on my artist natalia Tsaikinov, you can come here and that's her and you can read about her work and then you can connect directly to the art she created for this project so all of this art is based on traditions, um, Ukrainian art traditions, and it's all inspired by the quotes. Uh, so here, the Vitinanka, you can come here and she explains about them. This is a statement from her, an artist statement about the art. And then the slideshow uh, cuts through and you can see in the slideshow all the different pieces that she created. And there are quite a number of them. So they just go through. And it's the same case for each of the artists. So if we were to go into the Trinidadian artist, and we go here, and this is, she created a singular piece to represent that. And here's her artist statement about it. And you can go in and read about her as well. And that's her. And then we've got the same for our Chinese artist in Australia. This is the piece that he has um, for the installation and he explains it here. And you can go here and read about him as well. And that's him. And then if we go back to the homepage, the idea was that you could scroll through and see people's interwoven stories and see the similarities and differences between them. So as you scroll through, you'll see a quote from one of our participants about home and belonging 
and it's placed in front of a piece of art that corresponds to the community that they're a part of. So in this case, Trinidadian in the UK, in this case, Ukrainian in New Zealand. And um, we ran these quotes past all of the participants as well before including them. So they also had a say in what they did or didn't want to be a part of this online gallery, which was really important for us. And um, then you can click through if you want to read additional quotes. Uh, aside from what we have in the first online gallery, you can come through and read more quotes from the participants in each community. So these are the quotes from the Chinese community in Australia. Oh, where's my back button? Oh, I am here, sorry. And then as you continue through, you can jump through to read more quotes by the Ukrainian community and so on and so forth. And um, you can read what all the participants have to say, the, together we decided were the most fitting quotes for this in collaboration with the participants and with the artists as well. And then, um, so this was really important for us to highlight the voices of the participants, but also the emotions coming through um, that was very community grounded. So the participants all saw the art as well after the um, community members had done it and everyone who was involved in this project, all the communities was had a chance to see all of this before we then made it go live as well, which was really important to us because we well, we would make any adjustments that that they wanted because this is these are their voices, this is their project. Okay, that's all from me. I think that's 10 minutes. Thank you. Gerardo. Okay. So, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and uh, thank you very much to Corinne for this very interesting introduction to her work. So, just very briefly, I would like to briefly introduce uh, uh, the new ABC project. The new ABC is a project funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. And it draws together 13 patterns for nine. Uh, uh, European countries, uh, Italy, Spain, uh, France, etc., uh, with the aim of developing and implementing nine pilot actions. And um, uh, Anna has just recalled and referred to pilot action nine. Uh, and the main objective of the pilot, I'm the supervisor, uh, um, supervisor and uh, principal investigator of uh, pilot action nine. The main objective of this pilot was to produce through ethnographic, participatory, collaborative, and visual based methods stories of life and migratory trajectories of young adult asylum seekers and refugees within and beyond temporary reception centers, with specific attention to how asylum seekers and refugees experience and renegotiate linguistic, social, cultural, racial, and social class barriers and inequalities in everyday social practices uh, and how the latter impact on processes of uh, uh, sense of belonging, self-determination, autonomy, and human agency. And lastly, uh, kinds of learning activities, skills, and competencies uh, that help asylum seekers and refugees to adjust, uh, not to, in, um, to integrate, but to adjust to the new uh, social reality. So as far as uh, research methodologies, uh, well, it's, it's obvious to say that uh, carrying out research uh, in forced migration involves sensitive issues such as trauma, physical violence, social isolation, displacement, and immobilization. So for this reason, I decided, we decided, but I decided to embrace a research approach which minimizes the distance between researcher and research. I try to both construct ethical interpersonal relations uh, based on mutual trust, respect, uh, and recognition of research participants' subjectivities and identities, and uh, give them non-authoritative, emotional, and motivational support during the organization and development of research activities. So you know, when I when I'm research activities, I mean mainly interviewing digital narrative 
and storytelling, uh, which were jointly thought as open and relational spaces based on equal coordination of different subjectivities and identity and knowledges, um, open up the possibility for asylum seekers and refugees' voice to be heard. I also tried to involve research participants in all relevant steps throughout the process of conducting pilot activities by gaining their inputs and opinions, as well as uh, uh, renegotiating moments of tensions and occasional disagreement on specific research sensitive issue or topic. Um, we have now we uh, research and research and research participants. We have now entered the phase of research dissemination through meetings or workshops, um, conceived as uh, uh, shared spaces of discussion and involving local small groups of activists and grassroots associations actively engaged in the reception of undocumented migrants and when possible and I point out when possible also administrators and policy makers uh, i would like to share with you uh, a short clip from uh, the main docufilm producer uh, uh, in this project uh, because uh, dissemination mainly involves the public projection of the docufilm uh, its title is Migrant Lives, Remembering the Past, Living the Present, and Imaging the Future. And I would like to present this short clip uh, uh, from the docufilm, uh, focusing on SARS narrative, uh, uh, giving insights into the feminization of current global migrations. Um, SAR is uh, a young uh, girl from Afghanistan. Uh, at the moment, she's uh, in Germany. She wrote me she's in Germany. Uh, and uh, she went to Germany to visit uh, her brothers. Uh, so um, she uh, decided to leave in Italy with uh, her family, but their brothers continued their journey to Germany. And so now, now she's not in Italy at the moment, but um, she attends a school. She, she's got a job also as a waitress uh, in the northwest of Italy, in this small village where she lives with her family in a, a temporary reception center. But, okay, can I share this? So, condividi suono, that's it. All right, it's one minute and a half. In Afghanistan, always they are not a person, things for them or choose for them. But uh, in in Italia, no like this. The women they can choose, they can uh, stay on her feet, and uh, they can working, they can uh, walking alone, and they can they they can no so they they uh, they're free. But in Afghanistan, uh, the for study for. Uh, for you, the married, for all of this, they 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 do what another person said. Non posso vivere da solo. Sempre eh, con una persona. Sempre non posso viaggiare da solo. Sempre con una persona. Ma in Italia non è così. Di ragazze, di donne, andate di tutti i posti che loro ti piacciono. I don't know why they eh, <laughs> think like this. I don't know. Always they say the man's like this, the woman like this. I don't know why. <laughs> and we are all, always asking, but they and also they don't have a they don't have a response. Respond. Like this. I don't know why. I don't know why they think they are very special, but the woman no. I don't know why. Okay, that's. Um... <laughs> That's very interesting. That's quite a lot to say about that. But uh, the main point before I conclude, I want to make here is that uh, Sarah's capacity to reflect on her identity and subjectivity is embedded within power relations and gender dominant discourses, uh, denying her the possibility to reconstruct her own subjectivity, as well as uh, her aspirations to 
normality, if I can use this, this term. So SARS seems, uh, however, to respond to the complexity of our present life as a refugee by challenging gender identities, which are embodied and ascribed to Afghan women by patriarchal discourses. It is evident, at least to me, that participatory collaborative approaches may become tools for dissent, cont contestation, sorry, and emancipation. In addition, and as testified by this short clip, within forced migration research, digital narratives and storytelling, on the one hand, translate research data into lived experience of real and concrete individuals who are able to act and to reflect on who they are and their asylum and refugeehood conditions. On the other end, it is evident that digital narratives and storytelling are not only descriptive, but might become, for not always, and I point out, for not always, transformative of migrants' subjectivities and identities. So to conclude, well, the main questions for this pilot were and are, how can I design my research in such a way uh, so as to include uh, young migrants uh, um, as real and concrete actors in the field. And most importantly, who benefits from my research? Um, and I think that uh, as uh, humanities uh, scholars, researchers, students involved in forced migration studies, we need, first of all, to reverse our uh, Northern Western gaze. We need to change perspective. That's what I learned basically. And we must descend from the pedestal on which history, when I say history, I mean colonialism, imperialism, and if I can use this, uh, capitalism as well, has placed us in order to understand the way we look at migrants, the, lay, the way we look at others, and how they look at us. That's, I think, the main lesson I learned from this research. Anyway, and that's very difficult thing to, to, to carry out. Anyway, what, uh, the, the, the other question is, why do I do research on migration? As a political, uh, migration is and always been a political issue. An activist, a social linguist researcher, I define myself as like that. The principal aim is to understand and challenge processes of linguistic, cultural, social, economic inequality, oppression and violence, even violence, together with, uh, as Lourdes stated, together with uh, um, real and concrete individuals, groups, communities, to transform, to change when possible such processes. And uh, sorry for insisting on this, but um, for me, research as an activist and a social linguist, for me, research is strictly connected to how human beings so concrete individuals uh, act, behave, uh, and live uh, in a specific context and social reality, and so on and so forth. That's quite a lot to say, but uh, I have to stop. Thank you very much. So Gerardo, I think I'm the first one to ask a question, right, Nicoletta? Agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so you you already talked about this a little bit, but uh, so you talked about uh, what what you have learned. But can you talk a little bit more about what kind of insights did you get after making the video about the the experiences of migrants in Italy? So what are some of the things that you learned that you did not uh, you had not thought about before or? Also, do you feel that there were things in common among them or not? So these are my main mm. questions. Oh yeah, well, the, the first thing I would like to, to, to say um, is that uh, um, it was, first of all, very difficult to enter this, this world, this context. So forced immobility is very tough research uh, issue uh, because of many different reasons. The first one was uh, um, uh, legislative changes. So uh, as you know, we change government in Italy every two years, every few years or so, and uh, each government changes uh, the rules 
uh, concerning reception of uh, undocumented migrants. So it was very difficult for me to enter uh, temporary reception centers. The second uh, uh, limit was the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, which limited and constrained the possibility to enter uh, uh, such context. The only one was age. For me, it was very difficult to uh, comfort uh, uh, young uh, people uh, within this, uh, these structures. Very, very difficult. Again, for many reasons. The main one is that uh, young people are very, in brackets, mobile people. So uh, why uh, uh, migrants, and that, this is another aspect I would like to, to, to point out. We have to distinguish between uh, mobile individuals or undocumented migrants uh, and uh, etc. and migrants, because migrants, they already established in, in our country, in our cities, etc. And uh, well, mobile individuals, they, 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 they do not know what will happen to them, and uh, they are not also sure about what decision to take, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. But what I learned, first of all, is that uh, um, I was really surprised, uh, honestly, to, 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 to get in contact with people uh, who are really able to think about themselves. So we think about migrants, and that's a very common, common uh, vulgate and idea about migrants as passive individuals. But these this people, we, we, we are still in contact, we see every, uh, every week because they come and visit me, they stay, uh, they stay where I live in Genova and we talk quite a lot about everything. So uh, these people are not passive, non-agentive individuals, but they are really able to think about their social conditions, conditions sorry, they leave uh, and uh, uh, what they did and why they did. I mean, the migratory trajectories or uh, uh, life trajectories, why they decided to leave. Uh, and uh, also they were ready to face many and, uh, many and different difficulties in the place uh, where and uh, now leave uh, and, and operate. So I don't know if um, I'm going probably too far from your main question. But uh, really surprised about their ability uh, to reflect. And the SAR is an example. Why, 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 why I am like this and uh, men are like that. And uh, there are also other passages from the video which uh, illuminate the capacity and ability. But capacity and ability are strictly related to the possibility to do that. And unfortunately, the last government in Italy changed the reception system in Italy. And uh, we had a very good reception system in terms of capacity to offer possibilities to recover from a difficult situation. Um, and uh, they change it. Now you, uh, we had uh, small temporary reception centers, 20, 30, maximum 30 uh, individuals living there and uh, they had access to education, so language courses. Uh, uh, they had the possibility to exit this, uh, these structures, uh, to socialize, meet local people in some way, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But this changed. And now um, uh, we got these big centers, uh, temporary centers for undocumented migrants, and uh, they are not able, because uh, of the fact that uh, these centers are uh, inhabited by thousands of people, they're not able to offer anything. So the only thing they do is wait, to wait uh, for uh, who knows what, and um, et cetera. But I learned quite a lot, honestly, and I changed also my idea of how to conduct uh, ethnic research uh, and uh, to enter the field, but to, to conduct. And uh, the relationship between me and these, these people so changed my idea of what it means to, to take research in such context. Honestly, I met and uh, was able to listen to very traumatizing for them, 
but for me as well, uh, stories and etc. Sorry, I'm talking too much, probably. So. <laughs> no, thank you very much. I'll I'll, uh, I'll let Lourdes now ask a question to Corinne. Thank you, Gerardo. Okay, it's good. Thank you, Chief. Gerardo, thank you so much for for your reflections on this and everyone who will watch the full documentary will know very well what you're talking about very moving and it really gives the stage to to the protagonists to the immigrants themselves or it's really interrupting you you can spread the document you it's, can spread it's it. in the chat we put the link in the All chat right. so everyone can yeah, yeah. watch it it really is worthwhile all right gerardo can you mute yourself just just in yeah. the sound place a bad good thank you <laughs> so i'm gonna ask a question from corinne now and corinne the question is a little bit related to the question that anna had but um i i want uh, to hear from you what kind of advice you would have to other researchers who want to engage in research with side by side and with uh, uh particip their participants in this case refugees immigrants displaced uh, newcomers but in your case, you have, a, you know, you've done it for many, many years, but also you have a very complex relationship to the different communities that you investigate. So you have been very involved working with communities who are indigenous, Maori, Samoan as well in New Zealand. And in that case, you're more of an outsider, just as Gerardo was saying, you know, negotiating uh, the emotional and the research uh, relationships with with other people from other communities but in your case you also have a very long tradition of doing research uh, with Ukrainian communities in the U.S. diaspora and now in the New Zealand diaspora the newcomers the war refugees what advice do you have and how is the advice complicated when the researcher has an affiliation with those communities and as opposed to when not and degrees of affiliation as well I imagine Thank you, Lourdes. Yeah, as you um, commented, it's a very complicated space. Um, and I, when I began working in this space, I um, found that it was most important, first and foremost, to listen. To listen to the people in the different communities, to listen to advice from, from researchers and colleagues who had been successful in different spaces. Um, and one of the most important things that I was told and that I continue to practice and tell others is that you can want to do research with communities all you want, but if you want to do something that communities don't feel they need, too bad. <laughs> and so <clears throat> what's really important is to, first of all, establish that um, to let communities know you're here. And if there's something they need or that would be helpful for them that you could provide, to please let you know. And that's something that I continue to share with all the communities I work with. I've never stopped sharing that with them. And so the projects that we worked on, that we work on really do come from them. And um, that's how I also got into working side by side with Maori and Samoan communities as well. It was the same thing saying, these are things I can do. These are things I can offer you or related things to that. If at any point in time, any of this would be helpful for you, please let me know. And I'm really happy to work with you on that. And that's how that came about was then, um, <clears throat> was the, the communities then contacted me. But I had to show first by working with my own community that this was something I was dedicated to and that I could turn around truly community responsive work. And so that's another piece of advice that I've received again and again from people and that's played out to be really true is start work with your own community and spend time with them, um, use the shared understandings that you develop to co-construct something that would um, be useful. And so stories have been a big part of that. Um, asking people if they'd like to share their stories, documenting that, sharing that with them uh, so that they have stories that they can then share with their children, their grandchildren. 
um, family back home. And then the same with the art that's produced, um, keeping it really within the communities, giving the communities primary power over what that looks like. And I'm more here as um, when I do that on the ground work with communities, um, I come in for them, I'm seen as I suppose more of um, a person who can access resources and also someone who can provide advice on what things might look like. And, um, but it's still very much driven by them. And then after we do all of that, then I also, um, as previously agreed upon with them, will then produce uh, research output, other research outputs, you know, like articles and things like that. But that again, they get to review that. They get to tell me if they're happy with that, if they'd like to see something changed. So it all lives with the communities. And the way I think of it is um, that it's their, their data. It's their voices, therefore it's their data. And I'm just borrowing it where they let me. And um, that's something that has been really important. And that's something that that positioning of who owns it and that they own it because it's their voices. That position is also uh, part of what led to continued invitations from diverse communities to continue to work with them on different projects. And then if I if a grant opportunity comes up that I think would be great, I then go to the community leaders who I've established connections with and ask them what they think. And then what we put in for the grant is something that's already been ran past the communities and that they're on board for. And um, the other really important thing is to continue connections and relationships with communities outside of any research. So <clears throat> one of the things that we teach my students here and not just my students, but I learned as well is that you need to always be contributing and giving to the communities outside of research. <clears throat> so one of the things that one of my co-researchers from the Samoan community here said to, to, to one of my students once, which I thought was great. He said, you need to help wherever you're asked to help. So if that means going and helping pass out ballot papers for elections, then you do that. It doesn't matter if it's outside of your area because you need to show that you're committed to the communities and that you really are on the ground here to help. And um, that's been true for all of the communities I work with. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you did, definitely. Thank you. Nicoletta? Thank you. Thank you for wonderful presentations and follow-ups. Uh, really fascinating. I have, uh, let's say, a cluster of questions for both of you, um, because both of you, with your digital and visual work, uh, you, you, you could benefit from the financial support of institutions, so respectively the EU and the British Academy. And so I'm wondering whether you have anything to share about your experience uh, securing the sponsorship of these two entities. It is, uh, are you satisfied with the opportunities that national or supranational institutions make available for work like yours, focusing on migrants and refugees, especially collaborative projects like yours? Do you feel that your work and or the work of somebody else uh, uh, in their turn have influenced institutions like NGOs or political decision makers regarding the best practices for, let's say, integration of migrants and refugees. And by integration, I mean giving them real agency, going back also to what uh, Gerardo was saying, or the status of actual interlocutors in a shared space on equal terms. So if you have anything to share, that would be great. Thank you. Gerardo, do you want to go first since I just finished talking? Okay, okay, yes, okay. Well, um, we, we as, as I as I as I said, we are um, we, uh, the the project is still going on, and uh, the research project is still going on. It's a four year uh, project at the moment. Uh, we are uh, we. we just started uh, uh, the part of the project uh, which is called dissemination. 
Uh, and but dissemination is very important for this for this project because uh, it is not simply projecting uh, the docu film or the videos or, or uh, transcribing interviews or doing whatever is necessary to disseminate uh, um, uh, the, the, the the pilot activities. But it is uh, uh, it is it, it, it is uh, important because uh, we are trying to. Um, to um, to um, involve uh, different uh, social actors within the reception system, and uh, I'm not trying to do this on my own, but I'm trying to do this with uh, research participants. So the, the 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 individuals who took part uh, in in the research participated. In, sorry, and took part in the research project. So um, yes, I'm I'm satisfied because. Uh, uh, what we are doing is very important. So last week, for example, we met in Genova in a, in a social cooperative and there were uh, 50, 50 uh, people there. And uh, we and uh, two of uh, the person uh, uh, who contributed to the, uh, to the, the, the making of uh, the docufilm were present. Uh, it was also present a journalist and a photographer who is involved in uh, the reception of uh, migrants in the northwest of Italy. And the debate which followed the presentation of the video was really, really interesting. And um, uh, also uh, policymakers involved in the reception of uh, migrants were present there. And we tried to explain that they have to uh, at least aim to change their view of the people who uh, who uh, they interact with uh, and who decided to establish in Italy, particularly in the northwest of Italy, in the city of Genova, Turin, particularly. And um, it is very difficult, it is very difficult to do that. But uh, um, I think that in the end, we will be able not to change uh, or, or to change uh, uh, the story of uh, migration in, in Italy, but uh, we will be able to change perspective and to make people change their perspective, point of view, uh, etc. about uh, migrants. Uh, and uh, I'm quite sure about that. But it's just at the very beginning of the most, at least to me, most important and relevant part of the project, dissemination. So it means sharing, meeting people, exchanging, and so on and so forth. Okay, sorry. That's, that's, thank that's you. all. Thank you. Karine? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I suppose my experience has been a bit mixed. Um, so when the, Sorry, that was for that. With the British Academy, I have to give them credit. They were fantastic in letting us from the beginning say this is a partnership with community. We want to do this output that's going to be in the art installation. And they were right away, they were saying, yes, 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 this is great. And so they gave us a lot of freedom to do that with communities. Now, <clears throat> with the Royal Society, um it's it's a bit different because it's definitely more of a a colonial influenced institution and so it's um i do thank them for giving the support but the way we had to go about it was a bit trickier because they would only allow a single researcher to be named to hold this grant um so that had to be me and they um they weren't interested in anything that was uh, community-based outputs. They wanted journal articles, right? And I'm sure that's uh, a similar story to a lot of the major funding bodies. And so <clears throat> what that meant was before applying for the grant, I did talk with the communities about that and say, listen, I'm going to have to pitch it this way. And I will have to then fulfill that, but I want to build in a lot of other things that we'll be able to do together. So what that ended up meaning was also that the way it was explained to the Royal Society was in very academic terms that they wanted. Um, so it's kind of 
rephrasing things. So instead of saying, you know, that we're producing all of these resources for the communities together with communities, it was more like at the end, um, oh yeah, we'll also have these community, like something that will give them at a workshop, right? So it all had to be pitched as within a workshop and following on from everything else, right? So I, I'm still meeting that, <laughs> but it's a, a bit of making it sound like the focus is more an individualized focus and then the community stuff comes after. Um, that's the way that they required it in order to be funded. Um, but the communities knew that even though the proposal looked like that, that it was all going to be done with the communities together. And what that meant in practice as well was that the community members were not able to be named partners from the beginning. Instead, they had to be named as research assistants and then um, be given these research assistant or consultant contracts um, through, through the Royal Society, which is again, pretty tricky because you're asking people who maybe don't feel so comfortable with these institutional spaces to then sign on as a research assistant or a consultant. But again, that was all negotiated um, with the communities and they were, when I explained, you know, this is the wording we have to use, but you know me and I've worked with you and in practice it's a partnership. And um, so we did get it there and it was a bit of back and forth where I did have to push the institutions quite a bit to also give a um, wage that was closer to a partner wage with me. Um, but it's it's that sort of thing, I think, as uh, when you're a researcher, an academic in a, a privileged position of power, it is your responsibility to take on those negotiations, to be that person who does the work, who does the negotiating and the heavy lifting, um, because you are the privileged one, you are the voice. So I think that's really important to remember. Thank you. Nagar, would you like to ask a question from our speakers? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Seals and Dr. Matsafero, for your uh, great um, shares about the experiences with refugees and migrants. Um, I am a PhD candidate at Georgetown, and I, uh, in my dissertation, I worked with Afghan uh, newcomers and refugees. And uh, because I speak Farsi, which is a variation of Persian that is uh, mutually intelligible, um, for Afghan newcomers who speak Dari, um, I've realized that using their first language has been such a great asset and such a great uh, tool for you know um, getting to know their refugees lived ex lived experiences and you know just as we discussed, including their voices uh, in the research and in other collaborations. Uh, so my question is mostly about the role of language um, in your work. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, Gerardo, I saw your uh, uh, documentary, uh, and um, I think uh, most of the um, uh, people uh, in the documentary used Italian, which was the majority language of the society. And Sahar, uh, she kind of trans uh, did translanguaging with Italian and English. Um, so how much do you think uh, having this mutual language, although it's not their first language, um, facilitated your collaboration with them and in really understanding their lived experiences and um, the nuances of, of their lives and their background. And um, uh, I don't have a lot of information about uh, Corinne's collaborations with, uh, with uh, refugees uh, from Ukraine, but if you use their first language, how much do you think that was um, uh, facilitative or how much do you think using their first language was different uh, in, um, in, um, in, in your work and the details that you could uh, really, um, uh, you know, achieve from, from your collaboration with them. Sure. My turn, yes. Uh -oh. uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, question because uh, 
I'm involved in translanguage. So you mentioned translanguage, but I think that uh, uh, speaking a main language or uh, Italian was not uh, was not that important. First of all, because uh, they decided which language to use for the interview. So and asked them which language would you like to to go for <laughs> and to use uh, uh, during interview. And they decided to to uh, to use Italian language. But it's different with uh, it's different, but it is not at the same time with uh, Saad because um, uh, she was able to make herself understood uh, because she was able through by switching from Italian to to English. But that's important also to to point out that she learned English on her journey to Italy or during her journey to Italy. Sorry. And uh, she also learned to, uh, to, to draw. She learned quite a lot. So mobility and immobility at the same time are, uh, are transformative. Again, I use this term. So, but apart from this, so it was not a problem because uh, if you watch the video, you, you realize that uh, translanguaging was there, especially when she, show, uh, she shows us the drawing, her drawings. And she's able to, to use both linguistic and non-verbal resources, like the paintings, et cetera. And uh, that was not a problem because uh, what is important, at least to me, when we communicate is that uh, by drawing on different resources, we are able to make ourselves understood. And she was able by using, by switching from Italian to English, and also other resources uh, available in the context, uh, the interviews and the video uh, took place, um, allowed her to make herself understood. And, uh, and so language is not and was not a problem. Uh, so the decision to use Italian was uh, uh, absolutely a free decision to, to switch to Italian and um, and uh, and uh, what well, I should say, also say that um, um, uh, with SAR was uh, easy, very easy to understand. Uh, uh, though I cannot speak uh, 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 Farsi or any other Afghan language, etc. So language is not uh, a limit; is did not uh, constrain the possibility to communicate and to, to to understand each other. Sorry, I don't know if if uh, it's enough. But translanguaging is there, is in the video. So, oh, this is my mom, she's my mom, and uh, well, this is uh, an, an Afghan woman and uh, in, in the cage uh, and the goal. I mean, I don't, I don't need any verbal resource in order to understand what she's referring to. It's all clear yeah. to me and it's all clear to the people who uh, uh, watched and we watch in the in the near future the the video. So that's it. That's mm -hmm. why translanguaging is important in this. Right. This exactly. This, um, sorry. sorry. Yes, I, I was just going to add that if you go beyond comprehension, uh, do you think if having a collaborator, another collaborator, maybe from within the refugee community who could speak uh, their their own first language. Do you think that the, the amount or the extent of details or uh, emotions and so many other things that they could share in their own language would that have been helpful or would that have been different? Oh yeah, it would have been different uh, anyway. But uh, it was her decision not to have anyone uh, yeah. sitting okay. behind. So she said no. I would because she's well determined. And yeah. uh, as you as you, <laughs> as you can see now. She was able also to mediate uh, um, not only gender identities within the family, but to mediate whatever was possible to mediate in Italy and in a context of uh, involuntary immobility. So she's forced to stay in Italy, but now she's, she's uh, reorienting herself, but I think she's quite happy to be there at least. Uh, she said that she's happy to go to school to meet, and she was also able to go to work. She works on weekend, and uh, well, think about it so you you know exactly what I'm referring to. So, well, and uh, she also said very interesting, but there's so much to say about that. She was also able to do this because uh, uh, she is uh, in contact with uh, her brothers in Germany. And her brothers support her 
when she asks is, um, sorry, her father and mother, can I well, do these? Can I go out? Can I, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they uh, support her. And these, uh, she said, she, she explained to me, these uh, works for her and these contributed to, to, for her to, to, to change her life, to change uh, uh, and to reimagine her what she, she, she will be in the future and what she will do in the future as well. I don't know but if you're satisfied with Thank this, you. but, um, but just in case we can talk about that in a different occasion, I, I mean, okay. I might just follow on from that as well um, and just say that for the communities I work with, translanguaging is definitely present. And um, I don't know how much everyone knows about Ukrainian communities, but language is extremely political. <laughs> what language you choose, what language you use. Um, and so <clears throat> it's um, very important in Ukrainian communities to have people present who can speak the languages um, so that uh, participants feel comfortable speaking what they want to speak to best make themselves understood. That's really important. And um, for the next phase, the next project I'm working on that's connected to this one, we're actually working with people who are arriving as refugees uh, from Ukraine, working with them and their families. And um, so my primary research assistant who will be traveling with me to do everything, his family arrived in New Zealand from Ukraine 10 years ago. And um, so, and he's very fluent. He grew up in, uh, it, with both Ukrainian and Russian. And then he of course has uh, English from being very successful in New Zealand academic systems as well. And it's really important for me to be traveling with him um, because while I'm a heritage speaker of the languages, he, he's grown up with them. And um, so he can speak to participants and catch nuances in language choice and shift that I might miss. Whereas all I know some of, uh, I, well, I am very familiar with cultural aspects around that and some of the shifting, um, he's going to be much more tuned in to what he grew up with. And um, so, yes, for my communities, that's very important. Fantastic. Thank you very much, both. Thank you very much. We're having a very interesting conversation. We have about 45 minutes left of the webinar. And I would like to introduce our two students who are going to ask questions from the two speakers. And then we do have two questions in the chat and Negar will ask those questions. Um, so we want to make sure to cover all of this. Um, I'm very, very happy to have our two students here with us. Leila Mosafar and Megan Rao. And let me introduce them first, and then I will ask them each to ask questions from you, um, Gerardo and Corinne. So Leila is a sophomore at Georgetown, and she uh, they double, uh, they have two majors, government and linguistics, and one minor, Chinese. So they're very fluent in Mandarin, and they're very functional in Korean and they grew up in a Muslim South Asian American family. Leila has strong transnational expertise in China's relation with Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Macau, and in the colonial histories of South Asia. In their work, they have examined language and art as they relate to Chinese diasporic communities in the US and around the globe. And Megan is a second year master's student at Georgetown studying language and communication. She grew up primarily in the DC metropolitan area and has a background in phonetics, phonology, German, Japanese, and TESOL, prior all of these to graduate school. During her MA, she has focused on critical political and institutional discourse analysis as related to socioeconomic justice and knowledge gatekeeping, with a recent emphasis on Southern and decolonial studies that happily pervades every thought and conversation she has of late. And so I am going to ask Leila first to ask her questions, your questions. Um, yes, so my question is, 
Um, art seems to have a special power as a form of activism and awareness. And how has using art rather than or in traditional or in addition to traditional research writing impacted the message you are trying to convey? Does it drive a harder emotional note? Is it easier to digest? And does it speak to audiences different from research audiences? And this is kind of a question for both of you because I think both of exhibit um, both of your presentations were mainly art based. Karina, would you would you? Happy to. Thank you, Lila. Um, so yes, I think that art has been a really important vehicle uh, to um, connect the messages, uh, the findings, the words of participants in additional ways. Uh, I'm really big on multimodal expressions of identity. And so, and I come from a home of uh, where my mother, my Ukrainian mother uh, growing up, she's an artist as well. And so for me, it was a, a pretty natural thing to include art, but I think it was important to um, be very open in what that art would look like uh, and leaving it with uh, artists within the community. So first of all, I found my, my artist for that project by asking community members who within the community do you think does art that you connect with? And um, so who would you recommend? And Natalia Zaganok is someone who, whose name kept coming up. And so I met with her and we met and we talked and she asked, well, what would it look like? And I, I told her, it's up to you. <laughs> it's freedom of expression, it's up to you. And um, so she took that as a particular challenge because she also wanted to capture the emotion and the meaning and all of that um, that was in the words. But I think that because all of the people involved in this project drew on meaningful spaces to them and communicated that in diverse ways through through words, through art. Um, I think that it was able to, it's a, I would say more impactful um, piece and it resonates with more people. It has a much farther reach <laughs> than just academia alone. And it's something that people can spend as much or as little time with as they want and still get something out of. So um, I believe it's really important. It's why I am I now included it in the extension of this as well, because, and it's a major focus of the extension project because it it is really powerful. And in this case, uh, one of the pieces of art, uh, of art that we're creating next is, um, is participatory video um, that will become a film done with the participants and then there will be other art projects as well but yes is really important really powerful um there none <laughs> so well yeah um well uh, the, the, I didn't mention this because um, um, digital narrative interviews were at the heart of video production, but uh, I didn't uh, I didn't say and I didn't refer to the fact that uh, it was not my decision to 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 uh, to film uh, videos uh, and uh, digital uh, interviews, etc. But we decided this all together. And um, uh, and uh, uh, this allowed me to continue my conversation with uh, with research participants uh, beyond these momentary and situated encounters. So the filming of of, uh, of uh, the video, etc. And um, this also allowed them to uh, act in a more relaxed and uh, reflective way. So that what is important uh, uh, in, in this pilot, in this research, it, is that uh, we together decided what to do and why to do and with whom to do. And uh, also the tools, the means in order to uh, send a message, to spread the message uh, uh, worldwide. 
And that was uh, part of uh, a bottom up and um, sorry, uh, a bottom up and participatory uh, and collaborative approach, uh, which is at the basis of, uh, of uh, the, the, the of the, the pilot action. And, um, and also during uh, uh, during interviews and digital narratives, uh, uh, I decided, uh, uh, or we decided, I should say, we decided to construct uh, open-ended interviews, uh, uh, limited my intervention and uh, prioritizing uh, listening. So um, that's probably the most important aspect uh, as far as uh, uh, the, 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 the means we use in order to, to carry out our research activities. I don't know if I understood correctly your question, but uh, anyway. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much. Megan. Hi. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. And thank you so much for sharing your impactful projects with us today um, and elaborating on the intricacies of these issues and of your projects. Um, as uh, Professor Ortega mentioned, I've been reading and studying about decoloniality and Southern theories a lot recently. Um, and I'm wondering uh, a question for both of you. How do you see connections between elevating um, migrant voices and working together with migrants and engaging in efforts to decolonize our own minds in the world? Um, in what ways do you see these connections or why not, if not? Corinne, uh, would you? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> I'm happy to take this question first. Thank you, Megan. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, I definitely see them as connected. When I mentioned before, um, working from the beginning with communities and finding out what they want, what they need, and going from there, that's um, something that is well established in Kaupapa Māori, which is a Māori uh, approach to research. And um, there are multiple principles in that. And one of the top principles is you do what the communities want and the community you do it in partnership with communities and it's for the benefit of the communities everything you do needs to be for the benefit of the communities and i think that kaupapa maori um, principles are very important for and a very good guide for working not just with maori communities but with any communities and um, i think that <clears throat> there's a lot of wisdom in those principles. And there's um, a lot that that people who traditionally come from a more colonial approach can learn from those principles. Um, and I think that it helps guide uh, a lot of decolonial research approaches to help make sure that what you're doing is not because it's how I was trained or it's what I think is right as a researcher, but that it's really, it begins with, lives with, and ends with communities. So I definitely think those go together. Oh, yes, well, thank you very much for your question. So I would like to, to, to say that um, 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 community is, is, um, is not part of this research because uh, I just mentioned before, and when I tried to answer, uh, Anna's question that it was very difficult to enter uh, uh, this kind of community. <laughs> or, or, you, I, I, I can call it community, but it is not a community. So uh, temporary reception centers, very difficult. So uh, we were obliged, I was obliged to uh, contact people individually. And, um, and uh, these, uh, these, uh, uh, this does not mean that they did what they did uh, in terms of research and research activities because uh, they want to talk about themselves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They said most of them uh, said, particularly Hamed during a long uh, interview, said, "I'm doing this because uh, I want to make people aware of who we are, really are." and uh, why we decided to leave our country. And um, so uh, talking about himself and referring to himself, he was at the same time talking and referring to a community, if you 
if you if you uh, if you uh, want to talk about community in this sense and the um, the main aim of taking part in the projects was to uh, to explain who these people are and uh, so on and so forth so uh, the idea of community is not strictly related to what we did but uh, um, you get to uh, community through your personal individual perspectives uh, and uh, and also uh, stories uh, and so on and so forth sorry um but the, the, the idea of community is not if i if i uh, 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 understood correctly what you asked it's not part of the process so uh, we worked uh, um, we worked individually uh, for, first of all and uh, these uh, these uh, uh, change changes a lot what uh, was uh, at least at the very beginning the original idea of the project so to contact people within temporary reception centers and so part of a community and uh, precarious uh, displaced uh, traumatized community but part of a community so we had to reorient our uh, original idea to uh, to to and contact single individuals uh, and it took quite a long time to do this because we spent more than nine ten months before entering uh, the community and uh, uh, talking to people and then they as single individual decided to participate but they uh, do not speak for the community, they speak for themselves. For at the same time, this does not mean that community and other individuals within this context are not involved. I don't know if you're satisfied with this, but that's what happened. <laughs> Thank you so much, Megan and Gerardo. Um, we're running out of time. We're aware of that, but we also are aware that there are three questions in the chat and uh, uh, I think the people are still in the audience. So I'll say, Nagar is going to run the questions, but I, I'll say just to, to wrap it up fast, Eduardo Burgos, the question you asked uh, has been, I think, addressed throughout the, the session. So we'll go to Cecilia Castillo, Ayumetsi, and Nagar will read a short version of her question. Yes. Uh, the question is, how can researchers be instrumental in changing policies, laws affecting those communities? Or is that a role that does not need to be taken upon by researchers? Um, I'm sorry. All right, Gerard, yeah. are you okay if I jump in? <clears throat> okay, so I understand that the, the, the answer to this will vary depending on the, the researchers and the context. Um, in my context, I have a lot of power uh, it, because of my <clears throat> institutional affiliation and how that's regarded within my context. And so I'm very aware of that. And so I try to leverage, I try to leverage that wherever possible in ways that will be of benefit to the communities. And um, so focusing for the moment, particularly on the Ukrainian diaspora in New Zealand, we have this in New Zealand, we have this special Ukraine visa that um, was lobbied for by the Ukrainian communities that allows uh, family members of residents um, to come from Ukraine for a set period of time. Now, it's never been what we originally hoped it was. We were thankful it got approved in the first place but it's never had the same sort of uh, support that a refugee visa would have. And it also has a very short time frame. So we've continued with lobbying and um, I've been able to help write some letters, do some talks, go to ministry meetings, drawing upon my position and the status that that position gives me to help elevate the voices of the community members. So um, it's not just me. It, there are other people within the community who have that as well. We have a lawyer within the community who helps with that. Um, and we have a few other people who have political background uh, in the community as well. And we go to these meetings 
And we, um, beforehand, we meet with the community to ask what they want us to say. Um, and what, and we discuss that and we come up with a plan and then we promote the voices and the concerns of the community members in those spaces. And it gets us further. And um, I'm happy to say that now the, the special Ukraine visa has just gone back to cabinet to be reviewed for an extension and um, an expansion. So I think it, it, we, we can do work, it's hard. It's not always possible depending on various factors and contexts, but um, there are, there's always something we can contribute to in the effort. And finding what that is and using our resources to do that is, I think it's part of our role and part of our responsibility. Thank you. Well, as far as uh, the context uh, 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 for this research is concerned, I don't have uh, any power. The only power I have is, uh, is uh, to, uh, to, to, to work together with uh, individuals uh, asylum seekers and refugees, uh, particularly in the town where I live. And work together means also um, um, be able to, uh, to create any kind of contact, uh, uh, et cetera, between the local people and the newly arrived people from the rest of the world, which is, I think, and that's what I learned as an activist, which is, I think, the best starting point to, to change uh, situation. Of course, when I say to change situation, you don't have to think about uh, revolution and change uh, and change the world or how, or how uh, things are, etc. But uh, uh, um, the possibility to to open dialogue between local people and uh, and the migrants, etc., is uh, the best. Uh, starting point uh, uh, and uh, the best uh, thing you can do in order to change things. Uh, it sounds easy, but it is not, of course, and the stereotypes and so on and so forth and, uh, and uh, well, people say, no, I don't know you, why you're here, but why did, did you decide to, to stay here, but, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's, uh, it's uh, very difficult for both local and migrants as well. So to know each other is probably the best thing I can do. And projecting the film uh, within these uh, small associations, it doesn't matter if it's 10, 20, 30 uh, people involved in this. I think uh, that's the way. And th 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 that was what I uh, started thinking about before starting this, uh, or before being part of this project. That uh, what we, need, we we for example sorry and then I, and I and then I finish for example we were able to to talk to uh, local administrators uh, and etc and we were able to open a new language school for migrants this language school is now attended by one hundred young people from North Africa uh, Morocco and Tunisia and whatever. And, uh, and uh, this is uh, a success, this is a revolution. In a small town where I live uh, near Genova, we were able to do this and we will continue. I, don't, I know it's not the end of the story, but it's quite a lot. And um, people meet each other. And for example, a teacher said the first time I went to the school and uh, I was supposed to teach Italian. I was really scared because I didn't know them and then starting <laughs> talking to them and going out for a, a coffee and and so on and so forth and these uh, changed uh, situation and uh, quite a lot. Sorry, stop here. Thank you so much, everyone and our dear panelists. Uh, I know we have run out of time, so um, I want to thank everyone who joined us today uh, and for your questions. Uh, for your information, uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website, which I post in the chat. Um, and you can also uh, uh, see more information about our upcoming events from the humanities seminars at Georgetown. 
Um, so thank you so much, everyone, and have a great afternoon.